Here at Vail, one of our core values is to serve sacrificially. We believe that you never look more like Jesus than when you serve. If you haven't had the chance to jump onto one of our amazing serving teams, now is the time. We are in need of people like you to help us accomplish the mission we are set to do. There's a place for you to plug in, whether on the weekend or throughout the week. If you're interested in this opportunity, simply text SERVE to 309-777-0677 or swing by the info desk in the lobby and someone from our team will reach out to you this week. We believe that everyone has a next step in their faith journey, and we want to help you take it. If you're looking to take a next step of faith or looking to get plugged into community, let's move there together. You may feel like it's been too long or you're not sure yet. Connect with our team to help you navigate your questions. Take that next step today by simply texting NEXT to 309-777-0677, and a person from our team will respond, and we will help you move forward together. Here at Vail, one of our core values is to serve sacrificially. We believe that you never look more like Jesus than when you serve. If you haven't had the chance to jump onto one of our amazing serving teams, now is the time. We are in need of people like you to help us accomplish the mission we are set to do. There's a place for you to plug in, whether on the weekend or throughout the week. If you're interested in this opportunity, simply text SERVE to 309-777-0677 or swing by the info desk in the lobby and someone from our team will reach out to you this week. We believe that everyone has a next step in their faith journey, and we want to help you take it. If you're looking to take a next step of faith or looking to get plugged into community, let's move there together. You may feel like it's been too long or you're not sure yet. Connect with our team to help you navigate your questions. Take that next step today by simply texting NEXT to 309-777-0677, and a person from our team will respond, and we will help you move forward together.
Hey everyone, my name is Zach. And my name is Sean, and we are so glad you logged in to join us this weekend. We are so excited about it. We know there's a lot of things you could be doing on your weekend, and the fact that you chose to spend an hour of your time with us, it means the world to us. If you're new, we'd love to share real quick what's gonna happen today so you know what to expect. All in all, we're gonna be here for just over an hour. We're gonna start by singing together. We love to worship loudly at Vail, so go ahead, turn your speakers up and follow along with the words in the bottom corner. After that, we're going to hear a great encouraging message. We will provide you with next step opportunities in your faith journey, so please stick around afterwards. Throughout the service, we will have the chat feed open for you to share your thoughts and dive into online community with others who are literally watching around the world. That's not a joke. We are so excited for all God is doing here at Vail. We believe that watching Vail Online, it's a great first step. So as you check us out today, I would love to invite you and encourage you to come and join us in person at one of our upcoming weekend experiences. Listen, our service times are shown below. You, your family, and your friends will have plenty of space with full programming from birth to adults. Vail is consistently growing and expanding to bring more people into the church. And we believe in community and would love for you to be a part of what God is doing here at Vail. We hope to see you in person real soon. Yeah, like maybe next weekend. Like right, right now. Or now. No, well, next they weekend. They can't next, next weekend. We'll see you next weekend. Well, anyways, this service is about to begin, so open up the Veiled Church app wherever you are, in your car, laying in bed, on the couch, making breakfast. I don't know. Maybe you're actually watching worldwide doing one of those traveling things. Guys, just come visit. That's all. Anyways, hit the full screen button, and let's jump into the service. We love you. Giants fall deep 
sing this out. Cause you're the God who fights for me, Lord of And you have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ooh. 
just got done singing songs of a, a victorious God. I got done singing songs about going through storms. What I know to be true is whether you're in the room or online, there's some people that are in the midst of a storm right now. Maybe you've gotten bad news recently. Maybe you just got it just this morning. Or maybe you've been going through a season. Like, I don't know if I'm gonna make it out of it. What I know to be true is, man, God's given you the perseverance to endure it. He, that he's with you, he hasn't left you, he hasn't forsaken you, and he's in the midst of the storm with you. When you have that firm foundation on him, man, you're not gonna be wavering. We're gonna take a moment, we're gonna pray about these things. And if you're going through a season right now, man, I encourage you to lift these things up to God because it says in Philippians that those moments that you're anxious, those moments that you're worried, he calls you to pray. And why does he call you to pray? Because he comes and he delivers a peace beyond any understanding. It doesn't mean your situation is fixed, but it gives you peace because you know that the creator of the universe is there with you. So if you're in a moment, man, you're going through a storm, I encourage you in this moment, man, lift these things up to God because he cares for you. So let's pray today. Man, God, we come to you today because you're a creator, you're a God, you're a savior, who cares? Who's suffered, who's gone through storms. Lord, I pray for everyone who's going through this time right now that you give them the perseverance to endure that they would know that their faith and trust is in someone who's there. Not someone who's make-believe, but someone who's there with them in this very moment. Lord, I pray that you would deliver a peace in the situation that they have not had yet, that they get to walk in confidence, Lord, that you are there with them and you'll deliver them through this. And I pray these things in your name. We all said, amen, amen. Well, grab a seat. It is a great day to be here at Vail. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Uh, my name is Mike. I get to serve on staff as one of the pastors here. And if you are new to Vail, I'd like to say thanks so much for coming today. Maybe uh, you're the second time. You came back after Easter. We're so glad you're here. But if you're new, would you do me a favor? We would love to be able to connect with you because if you came, maybe somebody invited you and they think this place is pretty special. And we want to let you know what's happening here at Vail. So if you're new, would you simply do this? Would you take out your phones really quick? Text Vail the number on the screen, which is 309-777-0677. If you don't have your phones with you, you can look in the seat back pocket in front of you. There's a red card that said, my next step. Grab that card, fill that out, check the box that I'm new here. Don't worry, we're not gonna spam you, not gonna just bombard you with a bunch of things. We just wanna let you know how you can get connected here. Here's the cool thing. For every card and text that we get in, um, two things will happen. The first thing is we wanna give you a free gift. Just say thanks so much. We you know it can be a little daunting to walk into a new environment, a little scary, but we are so glad you're here. We just wanna give you a gift to say thanks so much for taking that step. The second thing we do is we send a one-time donation on your behalf to a local ministry partner, because here at Vail, man, God's doing a lot of incredible things here, but we wanna partner with some places that are making a, man, a capital C church impact. So just by being here today, you actually made a difference in our local community. And if you're here today, you got some little ones with you, what I know to, <laughs> could happen is they could get a little restless, maybe become a little distracting. I just wanna let you know, if that were to happen today, out in the lobby, we are broadcasting this experience live so you won't miss out on anything. We actually have a designated area for you and your family to sit with some soft seating and some toys as well. And the cool thing is that we can see all the great things that happen right here in the room, but there are some incredible things that happen outside of this room I wanted to let you know about. Ladies, man, there's a lot of ladies here and you work really hard, you need a night out, okay? So we're gonna provide that for you. We have Sisterhood coming up on May 3rd. I want you to know it is gonna be an incredible, so I'll piss a fist pump over here. Uh, it's gonna be an incredible night. Man, they have an incredible message, incredible time of worship. Their after party is insane. So if you're a lady in this room, make sure you, you sign up for that. If you're a husband in the room, do me a favor, nudge your wife and say, hey, you need to go to this. If you're a dad in the room, say, hey, I've got dad duty. And dad, no, we cannot hire babysitters. We gotta watch our own kids. And after you nudge your wife, I want you to know that we haven't forgotten about you this Tuesday. We have an event happening for all the guys in the room. We're gonna throw some axes at Gill Street. So make sure you come 6 to 8 p.m. So make sure if you nudge your wife about sisterhood, nudge her again, like, hey, remember when I was gracious, told you to go out there? You should let me go out and hang out with some guys. Here's what I know is that these nights are better when you're there. So if you want, man, get signed up for that. And lastly, if there are some people who just had a kid, we have a thing called Child Dedication Weekend happening May 4th and 5th, happening during our weekend experience. And I want you to explain why we do it. We do it because it's a moment to celebrate you as a parent. Obviously, we all love the kids when they come up here. We love seeing the pictures of them. But we celebrate you as a parent because God knew the greatest way for your child 
to know Christ, to know what it is to walk in this Christian faith is through you, which is kind of scary at times. But the greatest avenue if your kid have an authentic faith is what you model with them. So we wanna come, we wanna partner with you, we wanna celebrate you on stage that this next generation, man, is going to love and know Jesus. And all of these things you can find on our app and you can find on our website, but make sure you go, you go to that today because all of these three things require registration. And as you look across the room, you can say, man, Vail's kind of a big place. We like to take small moments to make you get to know the people around you. So we like to make Vail, which is big, a little bit smaller by asking a simple question. Today is a, is a would you rather question. I know we're all planning summer vacation, so this is a random question, I know. Here's a question, look to your neighbor and ask them this. Would you rather visit every country in the world or visit space once? Random question, all right, next 30 seconds, here you go. Good morning, Vail. So glad to see you. Hey, I got a good news for you today. Here's the truth. The tomb is still empty. Jesus is still alive. He is still king. We're still celebrating, not just last weekend, but all every day. It's Easter, and we are so grateful. But I do want to tell you, because of your faithfulness and what God did last week, we were able to serve over 3,800 people over Easter last weekend. Yeah, that's exciting. We can celebrate that. You're going to clap again because the best news is 24 people made a decision to follow Jesus last week and here at Failed Church. That's what it's all about. And so thank you for everyone who served and volunteered. And if that was you, we know in Scripture it says that our next step, if we decide to follow Jesus, is to go public with our faith through baptism to let the whole world know, hey, I'm with Jesus. And so two weeks from today, we're going to be doing that. I do want to shout out one of our student leaders, J High student leaders, Bailey, who just got baptized in a hot tub yesterday with our crew. Can we give it up for Bailey? If she sees here, she's going to be gone this summer. And so she's like, one of the students has challenged me and she goes, I need to do this. And so if you're like Bailey and you need to take that step of faith, you can never go wrong being obedient to Christ. I'm telling you. So in two weeks, we'd love to celebrate you. Go ahead and sign up by that text number or you can fill out one of those cards right in front of you as well. Now, I have one more thing I want to say before we kick into our series today. Uh, I love Jesus, but not the church. Is We have amazing people who serve this church called the VLT, the Veil Leadership Team. Uh, they're absolutely amazing. They hold us accountable. They, they're learning to love me because I'm the new guy, right? Like that's new. But they also love this church and we just want to get this thing right. And so we actually have a bunch of VLT members. Hey, look at that. We used the man himself, Jeff Cowden's VLT badge. But uh, just want to say congrats to your grandson by receiving Christ last weekend, by the way. That is absolutely amazing. But if you see one of these out in the lobby, uh, go ahead and say hi to them. Let them know what God's doing through the transition. They're there for feedback and want to hear from you. And we just want to make sure that we can have our ears open as we are growing in that. So they'd love to say hi to you and meet you. We're grateful for them. But can we celebrate them one more time? They have a big duty here at the church. Uh, and that's huge. And so appreciate all of you. So let's, let's jump in today. Uh, we decided that we're going to start a series called I Love Jesus, uh, but not the church. And we're going to kind of talk about this idea of church hurt. And the truth is, when it comes to church hurt, it's kind of an epidemic that's happening in our culture today that I think we need to navigate. And so we're going to unpack that. And we're going to start today, and it's going to be a three-week series. And so I want you to kind of go along with the ride. might be a little bit new today and something I'm trying, but I'll express that at the end. But we're going to go in the first book of the Bible in Genesis. <laughs> Last week we started in Revelation. I'm going to take you all the way back to where it started. If you're new to our faith or you have questions today, our, our Bible is made up of two parts. There's the Old Testament, the New Testament. It's the Old Covenant where we see the nation of Israel and the New Covenant where Jesus comes in to rescue his people through the nation of Israel. And so we're going to be in the Old Testament where it all started. This guy named Abram, his name will be changed to Abraham because God can do that. He can change your name. Uh, Sarai, which will be changed to Sarah. In this moment, let me give you some context. He's living in his native land for 75 years and God shows up and says, leave everything. And he says this, and go to a place I will show you. 
I don't know about you, but I want to know where I'm going when God asks me to go. He says, just step out, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later where you're going, right? And so after 75 years, Abram and Sarah leave their native country. They leave everything behind, and they take steps of obedience. The promise was that if he did that, God said, I will make you, I'll give you so many descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. The issue was is they couldn't have children. And so they step out in faith. They've been stepping in obedience. And 10 years later, they still have no child and no promise to show for it. And so Abram and Sarah do what a lot of us do. They kind of take things into their own hands. And they try to manipulate the promise their own way. I know you've never done it. I do it from time to time. And so in this moment, we're going to see their way of producing a promise when God had other Issues And so there's some weird stuff in here, but I'm going to hopefully break it down for you. Genesis 16, 1 through 6. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed pretty quickly, I guess, <laughs> to what Sarah said. Uh, so let's continue on. You might want to plug your kids' ears. Uh, so after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Now, before we continue on here, this is weird. Can we agree? All right? Like, this is what we talk about with our faith. Like, if you've raised in the faith, like, I've heard this before. If you're new to our faith, you're like, what is going on? And this is actually a lot of reasons why people don't even start journeying in our faith is because they think God is pro-polygamy and pro-slavery. And so let me just take a moment in case you watch a viral t video on TikTok that this guy who says he's a theologian has no idea what he's talking about. Uh, when you study scripture, you need to understand something. There's prescriptive text and descriptive text, Okay. And so when you look at scripture, descriptive text is something describing what is happening. Prescriptive text is a prescription, often like Jesus would teach us, that we can apply to our life so that we can enjoy the abundant life he has for us, okay? So describing is descriptive, prescribing is here's what we need to do to see and experience what God has for us. This is descriptive. This is not God saying he is pro-polygamy and pro-slavery. Actually, we're going to find out real quick, this is a bad idea, Abram, like obviously, right? And so we're going to find out that every time we see these types of things, it doesn't turn out the way God wants. So, then Sarah said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. I'm going to take a moment to ask the Lord to help me with this, because this is a heavy topic. So Lord, I need your help today. There's people who might be hurt from the church. There's people who might be navigating trauma, and there's people who honestly need to humble themselves and say sorry. And Lord, that's a hard task to do, all of them. But we know all of this leads to freedom, because if you're leading us to it, you have our best interest in heart. And so we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so I will say, um, it is absolutely an honor and a privilege to be able to, I believe, live out the calling God has placed on my life. Every day I pinch myself saying, how is this even true that I get to do what I feel like God's called me to do? Not that everyone has to be a pastor, but I'm just living that dream that I feel like he put in my heart. The thing is, though, I haven't always got it right. And I don't want to air out my dirty laundry list with you and share that. But I remember when I was a pastor, uh, I, I want to protect the sheep, as Scripture would call it, the flock. And so sometimes I can get very passionate about moments where I feel like they're in danger. And I didn't handle the situation very well. And what happened is it ended up me chewing out a lady on the phone who I didn't have much patience with. I had some wounds that weren't dealt with. I was in a vulnerable place, and I thought I was doing the right thing. And what happened was I was actually chewing out a person on the phone in which... We hung up, and then her husband called me later and, and confronted me and said, what you did was absolutely not right. And I remember in that moment, I had to listen to him, and, and deep down, he was right, but I didn't want to admit it. Like, I wanted to be like, you're right, but if she didn't have, right? And in this moment, I realized that I was the person that caused hurt to someone else, and it affected that relationship. And even though God can restore, it kind of hurt that relationship moving forward. Now, I share that today because I know some people in here must say, man, I, I've been church hurt. I've been church hurt. And I don't think it's going to be beneficial to be like, well, pastors get hurt too. That's not the per issue today. I have been the person who has brought church hurt. 
And so maybe today you're like that person. Maybe you feel church hurt. Maybe there's been someone in your life. Maybe it's a family member who's been in the church. Maybe you got hurt at your church. Maybe it was a pastor. Maybe it was a ministry director or leader. Maybe it was a group member or a facilitator. Let's just be honest. Maybe it was a member. Or maybe you have what I call contact church hurt. I'm not going to go deep down into that, but what that is, is there's so many documentaries out now and viral videos and people explaining their church hurt stories that these haven't necessarily happened to us, but because it happened to someone else, now we have contact church hurt because we're hurt because they're hurt. And, and it's, it's an epidemic in our church. And people are running away from church because of hurt that is taking place in their heart. I can't help but look at the story from Hagar. And how she has this moment where she encounters what I would say, quote, unquote, church people. Now, Jesus has not yet come. He has not died and rose again and started the church. But if we were looking at Genesis, Abram and Sarah were ancestors of the faith. These were as close to church people as you could get. These were supposed to be godly people who should have taken care of Hagar, who should have been there to encourage Hagar, who should have been there not to use her for their selfish gain. And instead, in their moment of waiting and weakness, they now have abused their authority and hopefully they can use Hagar for their own selfish gain. And she flees for her life. She fled and she leaves. Maybe you're here and you're fleeing. Maybe right now you're watching online. And the reason you're watching online is because it's safer. Because you really want to be back in this room because I encourage anyone to gather with us, but maybe it's too hard because the hurt was so painful that it's just more safe to sit at home and not be hurt again. Or maybe you're checking this out on a social media platform. You're like, it's less threatening if I can just grow my faith here. Or maybe you're here and right now your heart has fled from this place and your body is just about ready to follow suit. Or maybe you're here because you fled from a place where that hurt transpired, but you actually fled from a place that you ended up previously because you fled from another place to get to that place as well. And even though sometimes we want to isolate ourselves or sometimes we want to stay hurt, I want to tell you that it may not be the best option for us. But here's my goal today. I hear a lot of churches and pastors, and I'm glad that they're talking about this issue. But a lot of times what we do is we take 10% to talk about how the church hurts someone. And we take 90% of the time to tell them how they need to heal. And that's not my goal today. My goal today is to kind of look at how the church can hurt people and how we can be better at not hurting them, how we can be less harmful. My goal today is not to stop church or all in itself because that is inevitable. It's going to happen because we are imperfect people. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come. But my goal today is hopefully to see more people heal in their life if they've been hurt or maybe if they produced that hurt. And so I'm going to do that today as we look at Hagar's life and wherever you are and wherever you find yourself because I've been Hagar, but I've also been Sarai. And so what I'm going to do is I'm, we're going to have a little bit of fun today. I, I was looking on how we could navigate this. And so when it comes to criminology and it comes to like SVU, uh, by the way, like how many episodes or seasons are they on now? Is it like season 127? Like them and the Simpsons never stop, right? So what we're going to do these next moments is we're going to look at this church hurt moment like it was a crime committed against Hagar just so that we can wrap our mind around it. So we're going SVU, like don't, don't, like it's going to be good. So We're going to talk about the different types of church hurt and how we as a church can navigate that, and then I'm going to have a call to action at the end. But the first thing is this. We need to talk about church hurt in the first degree. Now, church hurt in the first degree is just like a crime in the first degree. When someone commits a crime in first degree, it means it was premeditated and it was intentional. And this is the most serious type of church hurt. It means it was thought through before it happened. It's like our kids, right, when they use us, when they say, I want to spend time with you, Daddy, this week. And I go, oh, yeah, yeah, can we go here to this store so you can buy me a toy? A.K.A., I don't want to spend time with you if you don't buy me a toy, right? Like, it was premeditated. It's a little, I mean, they're kids, I get it. By the way, if you want to talk about church hurt, just serve in veil kids, all right? Like, <laughs> my daughter will call you poopy butt cheeks. I don't know where she learned it from. <laughs> If you have been called that by Millie, my three-year-old, I'm sorry, we are working with her on it. I don't know where she picked it up. Probably from one of you leaders. Anyway, so, (laughs) church hurt in the first degree. Let's look at Genesis 16. It said, the Lord has kept me, Sarai, from having children. Now go and sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. She intentionally thought about this, right? She was thinking about what she was doing. Now, I want to let you know, this word slave in the Hebrew is more like a maid. This was someone who helped her on the house, someone who was close to her, someone who served alongside of her, someone who's very close. And I will say this, sometimes the biggest pain in our life comes from the people who are closest to us. 
Have you noticed this? This is why it's so shocking when we expect the church of all places not to hurt. That's where I was hurt. And so sometimes those closest to us can produce the most pain because we have the highest expectations from them. And this is what Sarai did to Hagar. And so she comes in, she premeditates, and she uses her authority and Abram's authority to get what she wants through Hagar. She goes, I've been waiting, I'm hurting, and I'm broken, and the promise isn't here. Maybe, just maybe, in that culture, we'll just have a child through one of our maids. Here's something we have to remember when we make decisions in the church. Church hurt can come when we think about how something can benefit us without understanding how it would burden others, right? We think more on how we're going to win from it, but we don't think about the loss that they're gonna go through when it happens. And this is what we have to be making sure that we talk about in this moment. In this case, Sarai was looking on what God could build through Hagar, but she wasn't focused on what God wanted to build through her. And so what she wants to do is she wants to get the promise at someone else's expense. And this can happen in the church. There's platforms and there's status and there's influence. And if we're not careful, we'll think it's something that we need to accomplish and we will leave a wake of dead bodies behind us. And that's when people leave the church. And so we gotta be careful to decipher what those things look like. And so James, the half-brother of Jesus, lays it down for us. Now, I will warn you, I'm about to read James. I only know he's a straight shooter, so you might wanna put your steel toe boots on real quick because this is intense. James says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show you it by their good life, by deeds done humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. I'm telling you, James pulls no punches. He's like, your wisdom is straight from demons. Like, that's how he is. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find every evil, or find disorder in every evil practice. Look at this. He narrows this down. He says, the moment we become envious, what is envy? She could not have a child, and because she didn't have, she saw what other people had, Right? I'm gonna use Hagar because I don't have the promise I want. We have to be careful when we feel like we don't have what God wants us to have. She wasn't really envious with Hagar. She was envious with God. And what happens when we want something that we don't have and we let envy take place, selfish ambition steps in. And we say, how can I produce this? This word selfish ambition in the Greek, it means factitious. It means self-promoting. That word factitious means this, to produce something from human strength instead of natural strength. Meaning, in this moment, God wanted to produce the promise, but she took it into her own hands. Hear me very clearly. I believe God has a plan for this church, and he has a plan for the church worldwide. But what happens sometimes in our waiting seasons, sometimes we don't want to wait for him to produce the promise. We want to do it with our own strength, and what happens is we will step over people to get it. So we have to be careful that envy and selfish ambition doesn't come in. Why? Because there you'll find what? Every evil practice. Malpractice. You know, like when there's a doctor who uses malpractice, they end up getting tried for that. Well, the church, there's a lot of malpractice. And so when it comes to first degree, we have to understand that people are abusing their authority and the practices aren't very good. And that's why we see scandals. That's why we see all these controversies. That's why we see people abusing their power. And we even, if in, in sobering cases, we see sexual abuse as well. Now, let me be very clear, besides the sexual abuse, I know that's a different topic for a different day. Let me be clear that when people mess up in the church, we should be the people praying for restoration for those people. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that people have abused their authority and have hurt people. And that's where every evil practice comes. And people have become a victim of these malpractices. And that's what Hagar was in. So... We have to be careful that we don't go viral off of other people's pain. That's just a way of saying, in this day and age, people rather have influence than bring awareness to people's pain. Actually, in today's world, people are using people's pain to gain influence. If I can just step in and make this about me. And so, the church is here to serve people we have to make careful that we don't step over people to build what we want to build. We want God to build what he wants to build. God wants to provide a child for Sarah when it was time for him to provide a child. And so as a church, I believe if we continue to say, you know what, we fight against envy, 
and we ask ourselves, Lord, is this me trying to make this happen? Or are you trying to make this happen? That's where you can navigate where we're going to move forward. So when it comes to first degree, if you've been hurt by their, I, I can't apologize that I was the one who did it, but I can't say I'm sorry that you're in that pain right now. But then there's the second degree. Church hurt in the second degree is not as premeditated and intentional, but the pain was still intended. Okay, so this doesn't mean that it was thought before. It was more of a crime of passion. It kind of happened in the heat of the moment, and that's exactly what we see in this moment. But we had a little fun with this, and so me and our production director, we took what a second-degree crime or murder was, and we're like, you know what? Murders are pretty intense to bring into church. Let's just put, quote, church hurt. And so he helped me work this through, and this is what a crime would look like. Escaping murder was put church hurt in. He or she is acting under a sudden and intense passion resulting from serious provocation by the individual causing church hurt, or another whom the offender endeavors to hurt, but he or she negligently or accidentally causes the church hurt of the individual. Look at this. He or she is acting under a sudden intense passion. Have you anyone ever said this when you're in an argument with your spouse? I'm just very passionate by it now, right? Like, oh, he doesn't yell. He's just passionate, right? Like, that's good. That's all right. No, they're in, in passion. They inflict pain. We actually see this in Hagar's case with Sarai. She already committed the crime. Hagar is hurting. She has conceived because of Abram and using his authority. And now there becomes to get a little bit of trouble in the house. And it said this in Genesis 16. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she now began to despise Sarai, her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, <laughs> I'm sorry, this just makes me laugh. But um, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. Like he should have known it was the wrong thing, right? God's not pro polygamy. Here it is right here. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Right now, Sarah says, I'm suffering. Sarah's in pain. See, before she mistreats Hagar after this moment, she's admitting to her husband, I'm in pain, I am suffering, I'm in turmoil. Have you ever heard this mantra, hurt people, hurt people? I mean, it's something we hear in culture, but it's so true. That when we are hurt, we are more apt to hurt other people. And so that's why I'm so grateful for the church and healing. But in this case, Sarah was hurt. Sarah was suffering. Sarah had pain. And so in a moment where Hagar begins to despise Sarai, She's upset, but listen to me. It wasn't because Hagar despised her. That was just the cherry on top. The reason this hurt so much was because Sarai already felt despised by God. She was already hurting. You know what? You remember how this started? The Lord has kept me from having children. No, he, he told you, Sarai, that he was going to produce a child for you. And now she's convinced that the Lord is rejecting that promise from her. She is now in a season of hurt and pain because she doesn't have what she wants. And I know it's hard, and I'm sure that's difficult, but what I'm trying to get to is Sarah was already hurting, and so the moment Hagar began to despise and reject her, it was just pushing on the wound that she already felt despised and rejected. It was insult to injury. It was like the time I got bit by my dog. I had a great dog. She's incredible. We'd throw Frisbee. She'd catch it. I'd show her off all the time. Great dog. And I remember one day I came home and I started petting her. She was jumping up and down. And I was rubbing her head and rubbing her back and rubbing her belly. You know, she rolled over and I pet her belly and she'd get back up. And I remember I was getting close and I started rubbing her ears. And out of nowhere, she yelped very loud and she bit my hand. I was shocked because this has never happened. I was like, what is going on? This is unusual behavior what is happening right now? And so I began to look at her, and as I began to investigate, behind her ear, she had this nasty sore that came from a bug. And the moment I hit that wound, she snapped and she bit me. Why? Because she already had a wound, and the moment I pressed on it, she bit. Sarah already had a wound by feeling rejected. And the moment Hagar despised her, it just pushed on that open wound. Now, that doesn't mean that Sarah was right. What it means is that she was navigating a moment from hurt. And so if we're not careful, maybe that's been you. Maybe the church has come because the person that you were dealing with, they had some trauma that they dealt with when they were kids. 
Maybe the reason they ghosted you was because they were fearful of what may happen if they say the wrong thing. Maybe just maybe the church hurt came from a place where maybe you didn't realize it and it doesn't make it right, but they had some unresolved wounds on their life and when we did something, it pressed on it and they bit. And that's why it's so important that we have to do something in our church. We have to heal. The author of Hebrews reminds us, how can we be better at this church? How can we make sure that we can be patient when those wounds that we carry into this world are pushed on? The author of Hebrews says, make every effort to live in peace. That's tough. We could use our whole life to work on this scripture. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. First off, look at what he says here. He says, let's make every effort and let's be holy. This word holy means set apart. In scripture, it says we should be holy as God is holy. If we follow Christ, we made the decision to put our trust in Christ. He gives us his Holy Spirit. And guess what the Holy Spirit does? He makes us holy. He transforms us. He makes us like Christ. But I love this. Holiness, without it, no one will see the Lord. We want people to experience our God. We want people to see who he is. And he says, when we begin to be holy, they will see who God is. Let me keep breaking this down real quick. So that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root grows. I love this idea. He says, when you get bitter, Sarai was bitter with God. And because she was bitter, it took root in her heart. And the moment an offense happens and we let bitterness take root, it says it will grow up. And here's the dangerous part. And it will trouble and defile many. Bitterness can destroy churches. Bitterness will destroy marriages. Bitterness will destroy families. Bitterness will destroy work environments. Why? Because it grows up and it begins to poison the entire system. Sarah was bitter because of what she didn't have. And so the author of Hebrews says, we need to be holy so people can see the Lord. Holiness is wholeness. Holiness is healing from the world's trauma, what we've been like. Holiness is healing from the trauma of the world. You know what holiness is as we come to Christ? It's realizing that when we come in here, we all bring our own trauma. When people come in here and they act like they have no trauma, I'm like, oh, that's cute. Right, like everybody else has trauma, right? Like we wanna pick up our magnifying glass for everybody else, but we don't pick up the mirror ever. Holiness is learning to heal from the trauma. Here's what I'm saying today. If hurt people hurt people, the other has to be true as well. Healed people heal people. It is important as we come to Christ that he begins to perfect us. Do you know how we minimize church hurt? We can never just stop it because we're imperfect. Do you know how we minimize it? We heal. Do you know how we minimize hurting our spouse? (laughs) We heal. Do you know how important it is to actually not just come to Christ for forgiveness, but how important it is to allow his Holy Spirit to work in you to heal you? Because when we begin to be healed, we begin to be holy like he is holy. And listen, when we actually choose not to bite people when we want to bite people, people will be like, why are you different? because they will see the Lord. Holiness will open the door for people to see the Lord. And so when we heal, what we're doing is we're not responding the way the world responds. We're not treating people the way the world treats these people. I know Suits makes for a good TV show, but that's not how we should talk to the people in our office. Why? Because Jesus says, man, serve those around you. Be patient, be kind, forgive. So, as we navigate this series in church here and we take the next couple of weeks, we need to remind ourselves as a church, how can we? Remember, we're not talking about the victims right now. We're talking about the church. How can we keep growing in this season where people are fleeing the church? Let's be just devoted to allowing the Holy Spirit to heal us so that we can begin to see more people experience the Lord. The last one is this, church hurt in the third degree. Church hurt in the third degree. Now, it's, it's, a, it, it's the less damaging, but it's still serious. And to me, honestly, it's the hardest to actually navigate. Because in these moments, it makes me super frustrated. Because when it comes to the third degree, it's more of people who were actually trying their best. They didn't know they were inflicting pain. That's exactly what happened. Hagar was upset with Sarai. And in this moment, they're mistreating each other. And it says this in Genesis 16. It says, your slave, 
Sarai said this, uh, your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. (laughs) Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. She goes, do whatever you think is best. And so Sarai thought, you know what? I think what's best, I'm gonna put her in her place. I'm gonna mistreat her. Do you hear this? Abram says, do whatever you think is best. I know in my life I have hurt people because I did things that I thought was best. I felt disrespected, gotta put them in their place, right? I see people in churches take scripture and know it's important and they use it to manipulate and hurt more people who are already hurting. Or we say pithy one-liners when people just wanted us to listen. And what we're doing is we actually think what we're doing is best, but in result, it's bringing a lot of hurt. I mean, if you want to see this, just see how uncomfortable Christians get at a funeral. Sometimes some of the most hurtful things are said at a funeral. Oh, yeah, well, I guess God wanted them there sooner. If you're like, I've said that, you've inflicted church hurts. <laughs> and I know, but what am I trying to say? I'm not trying to come out. I'm saying sometimes we're just, we have the best heart and we're trying to say the right things, but in doing so, we don't even realize it. We did what was best and it's actually caused hurt. And so there's third degree, which is premeditated. There's second degree where we're healing and yet we lash out. But the third is like, I thought I was doing best and making the right choice. And that's what's happening in our culture. We have bosses who think they're doing the best. We have politicians who think they're doing the best. We have people who are responding in the ways that they think the best is. And yet they're still hurt all over the place. So what can we do different as a church? Well, I want to push back on Abraham's remark by saying, you should do whatever you think is best, Sarah. I think that's terrible advice. That's not good wisdom at all. I want to give you better wisdom. Instead of doing what we think is best, we should strive to do whatever God says is best. Let's aim there. Now, for some people, like, oh, but that's why the crusades happened. And that's why there's been a lot of people who have said, because God said, I've done this. Now, please do not look at those moments of people who twisted scripture to get their desires done and miss, miss this point. What I'm saying is Sarai could have handled this better by instead of saying, you know what, instead of doing what I think is best, Abram, you know what, let's ask God who's been faithful to us what he thinks is best. Because I could tell you, based on scripture in the New Testament, what Sarai should have done in this moment. You know what God God thinks is best? He thinks reconciliation is best. How do I know that? Jesus. Jesus came to reconcile us with God. Remember that? Remember Jesus on the cross? Do you remember who put him there? The church. The church hurt him. And he still died on that cross to reconcile us. So Sarah should have been like, hey, I've put you in this position. I've hurt you. And I'm sorry. And she should have aimed for restoration. That should have been the step forward. But instead, Hagar is fleeing for her life. I want to land a plane here right now for this week. If you're here, a lot of times we look at Hagar, and maybe there's some people in here who feel like Hagar, but let's be honest, sometimes we're Sarai. And I want to challenge us today. If we have been those people who have hurt those within the church or or outside the church, that we would say, you know what, instead of saying whatever I think is best, maybe I should ask whatever I think God, whatever God's best. Can I challenge you? to pray and put those names down and apologize? Because when we do that, it makes us holy. And when God makes us holy, people will see the Lord. I'm telling you, the Lord can still work in our humility and apologies just as much as he can in our perfectionism. But maybe you're Hagar. And you're like, Sean, I hear that, but I'm the one that's hurt. And I... I can't say I'm sorry because I'm not the one who hurt you, but I can say I'm sorry for the pain that you're in. But I will remind you that no matter where you are right now, if you feel like you're fleeing and you're hurt and you're pain, God still sees you. See, Hagar left and in Genesis 16, 7, it said the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. I love this. The Lord found Hagar. In the middle of her pain, in the middle of her hurt, when no one else saw her, God saw her. And if you're here today, I wanna let you know God sees you too. Now this is gonna feel a little bit different because there's gonna be no resolution here and we're gonna have to lean into that. 
Man, I was feeling awkward last night when I was like, I feel like I didn't finish the message, and here's why. Because next week, we're gonna find out how God begins to encourage Hagar in the middle of her pain to step back into a place of blessing. But that's next week. So if you're hurt, I wanna invite you back. But if you're here today, we're gonna take a moment to pray. And we're gonna take a moment for God to speak to our heart, and we're gonna be still. And if we need to apologize or we need to reconcile, pray that we would have the strength and the faith to do so. And if you're here and you feel like you've gone through something traumatic, I just want to encourage you that God sees you where you are and that he wants to heal you even this today. He says that he is amongst us. Scripture says where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst, and he's a healer. Don't overlook what he can do in a moment in this time. And as we pray, you might be here and you might say, Sean, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, and I want to start one. I'm going to give you an opportunity to that as well in our prayer. So with eyes closed, let's just take a moment to ask God to heal our hurts to make us holy for he is holy. See, Jesus has already forgiven us, but now he wants us to bring restoration to those around us. Forgiveness and grace he's already given us, but reconciliation's in our hands. And so Lord, I pray right now that you give us boldness and courage. I know there's been people the last few weeks I have been reaching out to just to say I'm sorry. I just think that there's a precedent here, Lord, that, that if we take these steps as a church, that you can open up doors that we can't. And so I just pray that you would do that. I pray you give us boldness. I pray, Lord, that as we do it, that there would be healing that would take place. There would be wholeness that would take place. And I pray for everyone in here who feels like Hagar, who is broken, who is hurting. I pray wherever they are, if they feel lonely and scared, that you see them. You see them in their pain. You see them in their hurt. And you are not done with them yet. You weren't done with Hagar, and you're not done with them. And so I just pray that you would say and speak to their heart that you love them, and that you found them as they're running for their life. Lord, heal us today. Strengthen us today. Lord, speak to us today. You are a healer, and we're so grateful for you. If you're here and you're that person that wants to follow Christ, this is your moment that you can put your trust in him. He came to reconcile the relationship between you and God because our sin separates us, but he died for it. If you want your debt paid, just put your faith in Christ. You can pray this prayer with me right now. Just focusing on God, say, God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, as my savior. I'm a sinner who missed the mark, and I need you to restore me. I want a new life in Christ. I put my trust in you. I believe you died for my sin, and you rose again three days later to give me a new life in you. I put my faith in you, I put my trust in you, and I want to be holy as you are holy, God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you made the best decision of your life. Now listen, I'm gonna ask you in a couple seconds, if you did that, to lift your hand up at the count of three, and here's why. Our whole church loves to celebrate those who make that decision, and we wanna celebrate with you and welcome you to the family of God, not to embarrass you. And one of our amazing ushers are gonna put a box in your hand that's gonna help you with your walk with Christ. It's got resources, it's got some booklets in there, and a Bible that's gonna help you in your new journey. And so if that was you, with courage for a few seconds, just throw up your hand so we can celebrate at the count of three. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he dies again. Three, all over the room, if you said, I made that decision to follow Jesus today, I want you to throw your hand up. If you're online, there's a link that you can click as well. But make sure it's high so our ushers can see you. If there's no one in here today, we had two young ladies who made that decision last night. Can we celebrate them in our church and what God has done? Great experience. It's so cool. Last time I got to celebrate those two ladies, man, making a decision to follow through Jesus. And maybe your next step today is getting baptized. And maybe you feel like, hey, I've been a Christian too long. This is a little embarrassing for me to get up here and do that. I feel a little bit of shame. But I want you to know that every single month when people come up and share their testimony, it speaks to someone. So maybe somebody's waiting to hear what God has done in your life as you go public, man, to push them in their next step. So maybe that's what it is. If that's you, simply text NEXT to 309 777 or take the red My Next Up card, fill it out, and take that next step. As we continue our service through giving, I want to pause for a moment um, because we're going to take a moment and talk about giving. Like, and the heart of giving, the heart and the action, is that if you look down in the seat back in front of you, you'll see a giving envelope. There'll be a passage on it. If you look back at our giving boxes, there'll be a passage on it. If you've gone to church for a while, You've heard this passage before, maybe it caused a little bit of tension in your heart. 
This passage is 2 Corinthians, and it says this. It says, each of you should decide what to give. Decide it in your heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I remember when I was younger, I'd hear that, and I would feel like I would always feel those things. I was wondering, did God want me to be fake? Did he want me to give and have a fake heart behind it? I'd be like, here you go, God, here's my money. I feel reluctant. I feel compelled to give. But what this passage is saying is that you should decide in your heart what to give. And why is that significant? Because, hey, we don't want you to give because of veil. We want you to give because of tradition or pressure, but because of your heart. Because Jesus always dealt with the heart. And there's a passage in Ezekiel that says that through God, he's going to give you a new spirit and a new heart. Why? Because he wants you to follow his ways. What I know in my life is through a long journey of Christ, man, I've been very, man, made a lot of mistakes. Man, through time after time, I've seen God be faithful. Through time after time, God has matured me to where I've become a cheerful giver, not because of the action, because of the heart, how God has transformed me. I want you to know, if you're a Christian in this room, God has never been about behavior modification, but a heart transformation. And that's what transforms me into being a cheerful giver, that every single month when I go and I give, it's not because I'm a pastor, because I'm a follower of Christ, that He's matured me, that I'm allowed to trust in Him. So maybe that's you in the room, that's your next step, is that, hey, it's not about the behavior, it's about that God has transformed your heart. He says that if you're a Christian, you are a new creation, and His ways are so much better. His ways, man, has so much more fruit in your life, and you can trust in that. So if you want to give today, there are four safe, secure ways to do that. If you want a physical gift or offering, we got Dropbox located at each exit. You can text Vail to 77977. If you go online on our website at Vail.church or go to our app to set up a one-time or recurring gift. And if you're in this room today, if you'd like prayer, our prayer team is right up front. They're right over here. They would love to pray for you. If you'd like to sit in this room and just kind of just, man, just, man, to think about today's service, what God spoke to you, feel free to sit here. We're gonna keep this room a little bit more quiet. But for everyone else, we've got community members on each side of our stage. I'd love to invite you back next week as we continue this series. Bring somebody along. It's gonna be a great month to be at Vail. But you are dismissed. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.